So the differences between men's and women's, particularly small businesses, was an area that I actually had to do a lot of research on because most of what I knew was kind of anecdotal. And I found a, a couple of trends that, that stuck out in the industry. One thing is men and women tend to go into different types of businesses. Women are often more in the services, men might be more in the what we, we call the real sector where they're, they're making things. And as a result, the need for financing might be a little later for women. And so they may not necessarily, um, you know, have collateral to pledge because they're in a service industry, or at least the collateral that's accepted by many financial um, industries is, uh, you know, real property or land. The second, and this one really got me angry because there's this persistent theme in the research and in, in discussions of women-led businesses that women are more risk averse. And the reason that got me so angry is what I kept reading was that women would tend to save and then borrow at a later stage in the development of the business after they had built up savings. Or we saw in a couple of um, cases, women would grow one business to a certain level and then start a second business. So that one always kind of got me upset. And then the third one is the third reason that you'd read a lot in the, in the literature was, was frankly just plain old ordinary bias and discrimination against women-owned businesses. And that's where I think we're seeing fintechs and artificial intelligence really giving us some, some important insights because it's really hard to prove outright discrimination. But now that we have so much machine learning and algorithms that are determining credit decisions, we can look at how much bias is in those algorithms, how much is baked in. After all, people with their biases are the ones who are are building those those algorithms. And so actually Women's World Banking is doing quite a bit of really interesting research on uh, algorithmic bias and helping financial institutions who genuinely want to lend to more women, making sure that they're not somehow unconsciously uh, weeding women out of the, the pool of companies that they might be banking. Think about whether you might want to do some gender lens investing in your own portfolio. Do the companies you're investing in serve women? Are they serving as many women as they could? And are they led by women? And then finally, take a look at the leadership of your bank, of your insurance company, of your asset manager. Is it a gender diverse team? Gender diverse teams have better outcomes for complex problems and your portfolio deserves the best possible team. The low-income women that I've met throughout my career have been a constant source of inspiration for me. They persevere, they're often living in really terrible circumstances and yet they make the most of that. They are committed to their families. They think of their own success. Some of them have built businesses from nothing, but when you ask them, how do they define success? It's always about their kids' education, what they've been able to achieve for their community. And I admire not just that, they're not, they're not um, shy about what they've accomplished, but there is a, an element of selflessness about what they've done that I admire greatly. So women's financial inclusion is a huge goal and can drive so much change. First of all, we need policy change. There are important regulations that need to be changed so that women have a level playing field to access services. Financial service providers need to start seeing women as valuable customers and providing products that meet their needs. And each of us needs to be a conscientious consumer of our financial services.